We've entitled our thoughts this morning, The Last Adam, The Last Adam. Our message today focuses on one of the characteristics of our salvation as it was, as it is in the Lord Jesus Christ, an aspect of it or a phase of it that was accomplished completely in its entirety at the cross. And I direct you back this morning to the book of Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30, as we want to expand on one of the phases of our deliverance from sin as it is listed out for us in incremental phases, if you will, in Romans chapter 8 and verse 30. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified. Now hang on to that word justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Last week we finished up some thoughts on the subject of suffering from Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30. As you know, over the past couple of weeks, we looked at the concept of suffering, the fact that we all suffer, that we are to cry out to God in our affliction. We are to have faith and trust in Him, that He loves us and He cares for us, and that He will never leave us nor forsake us. And then finally, that we are saved by hope. As we trust in Him and we believe His promises as they apply to us, there is a deliverance to be found in the hope itself, as we hope in Christ for the deliverance, hope for a better day, a better day that will ultimately be realized as Jesus comes again and delivers us from this present evil world, as we find final, ultimate, complete, and eternal deliverance from the struggles and the afflictions of this life. Last week, we looked at these bedrock words of the Apostle Paul in Romans 8, 29, and 30, and we brought out the context of this passage, and we spoke about the fact that we often use this passage to explain to people who are new to the faith the order of salvation, how it is that a man or a woman is saved from their sins. And if you were to ask anyone in the world today, how is a man saved, or how is a woman saved from his or her sins, how is a person saved, quote unquote, you'd receive any number of answers to that question, but Romans 8, 29 and 30 give you the biblical structure of salvation. We are foreknown of God, and we are predestinated of God. We are called of God, we are justified of God, and one day we will be glorified of God. He foreknew you when He chose you. He loved you before the world began. He then predestinated you. He set your destination to be conformed to the image of Christ in the resurrection of the dead on the last day. When He raises the dead, He will raise His children conformed to the image of Christ. Those he predestinated, them he also called. That refers to the call of the Holy Spirit. We are conceived in sin and shapen in iniquity. We are dead in trespasses and sins without Christ. And the Holy Spirit calls us from death in sin to life in Christ. We come to life in Jesus. We are eternally delivered. We're possessors of eternal life the moment, the instant that the Holy Spirit resurrects our dead souls from death and sins unto life in Christ. And then finally, in the last day, we trust by God's grace that we will be glorified, raised as a joint heir with Jesus, incorruptible in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we concluded last week from Romans chapter, or 1 Corinthians rather, chapter 15. Today I want to zoom in if God would be our helper on this word justified, justified. Now as we pointed out last week, as Paul shares these bedrock truths of salvation with us, he doesn't do so from the perspective of setting straight someone with the wrong idea on salvation. And he doesn't write this in the midst of a theological commentary on salvation. He writes this in the midst of a discussion about suffering. And so, child of God, as you suffer, as we all suffer, 
what Paul intends for you to know as a deliverance to give you hope in the midst of that affliction is that God has foreknown you, predestinated you, called you, justified you, and will glorify you. And so as we think about justification today, I think that our heart and our mind can be similar to the children of Israel in the year of Jubilee. What is the year of Jubilee? It was a time every 49 years in ancient Israel when all the debts were to be forgiven. Every slave, every servant was to be set free and there was complete forgiveness in the land and they called it the year of Jubilees. The Jubilee would sound and anyone and everyone who owed a debt to another would rejoice because their debt had been forgiven unto them. As we think about the concept of justification today, I want it in our minds to be a sort of year of Jubilees to us. Our debt has been forgiven. We have been acquitted of the charges that were brought against us, but these were not false charges. These were true charges. We are guilty in and of ourselves. We were guilty of sin in the sight of a holy and a righteous and a just God. We deserved his wrath. We deserved the penalty of our sin, but God has justified us. He has declared us righteous in his courtroom by grace through the offering of his son, Jesus Christ. Once for all upon the cross of Calvary, we are made just in the sight of God. Now that's an amazing thing. And when Paul writes about that, bringing his thought back to the concept of suffering and afflictions in the world in verse 33, he says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Where do you find your justification today? You don't find it in yourself. You don't find it in your works. You don't find it in a decision that you've made. You find your justification in God. God has justified you. And if God be for us, as we read in Romans chapter 8, who can be against us? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Laying anything to the charge is a legal construct. Who can accuse you of a crime? Now, we can be accused of crimes in this world's justice system, and Peter would exhort us, if we suffer, let it not be as an evildoer. If you speed on the highway, you deserve the ticket. And when the police officer pulls you over, and you are all guilty of that, amen, boy, I am. I had to pick one we're all guilty of. When he pulls you over and he says, sign this ticket, you cannot look him in the face and say, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? <laughs> he will say, sign this or you go away in the back of the car. This relates to our eternal deliverance from sin. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Now, as we begin to think about the concept of justification being a legal term, and we'll speak much about this today, what entity in the world would want to accuse God's elect? And that word elect is a word that has reference to those that are foreknown. And it's a noun. It describes a body of people that are saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the term that Jesus puts on his people. He would speak about afflictions being shortened for the elect's sake in Matthew chapter 24. Paul would speak about the elect in Ephesians 1 and Titus 1. Peter would speak about the elect in 1 Peter 1. John would speak about the elect in 2 John. It's a biblical word and it has reference to a body of people. Who shall lay anything to the charge of these people? Well, who would lay anything to the charge of these people? Now, sometimes we get in the flesh and we accuse other of God's children and we're warned in the parable of the wheat and the tares, never, ever look on another person and claim definitive, perfect knowledge of their eternal standing with God because the Lord knows them that are His. Now, I can look at someone and their fruit can be very ill-speaking of them and I can have no confidence in them. But the wheat and the tares tells us that, if you're not familiar with the parable, God sows wheat, an enemy comes and sows tares. The disciples say, do we go pull up all of the tares? And he says, no, you'll uproot the wheat with the tares. You don't have the discernment that I have. I will settle all this 
when I come again at the end of time. Sometimes we can be accusative, but who ultimately wants to accuse God's elect, as it were? Who is the accuser of the brethren? Do you know who the accuser of the brethren is? Satan, that wicked one. Which tells us when we go around with an accusative attitude, I'm going to step on my own toes here. When we go around with an accusative attitude towards our brothers and sisters in Christ, in our church, in our community, in our home, who are we emulating more, the Lord Jesus or that wicked one? That's food for thought for you this morning. Who do you think would lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It would be Satan. Satan lays things to the charge of God's elect. He is the accuser of the brethren. If Satan had his way, he would stand before God and he would accuse you before God. What happens in the book of Job? Hast thou considered my servant Job? God is speaking as the sons of God gather together and Satan begins to interweave in the midst of them. And some people understand that as children of God in worship. Some people understand that as a company of angels as they present themselves to the Lord here. Satan begins to intermingle among whichever. And God says to him, where have you been? Well, I've been wandering to and fro in the earth. Well, have you considered Job? I have. And you've got a hedge so far about him that I can't touch him. But if you take that hedge away, he will curse you. And Job begins with this colossal battle between God and Satan and the life of a man named Job that he doesn't even perceive until it's all over with. But what does Satan do in the book of Job? He accuses one of God's children to God. Now, as we think about justification today, let this question remain in your mind. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Even the wicked one himself can lay nothing to your charge. Why? Because it is God that justifieth. It is God that justifieth. God justifies you. God justifies you. As we introduce to you the concept of justification, there have been several ways that Bible believers, Christians, and maybe some who are quite unsound in their thinking biblically, there have been many ways that they've understood the concept of justification and the history of the church. There have been many religious battles fought over the doctrine of justification. The entire Protestant Reformation was fought largely over the doctrine of justification. What sparked it all was Martin Luther's opposition to the Roman Catholic view of justification. Now, I'm going to share with you three basic views this morning, and the last of these is our view. It's the one that we defend, it's the one that we uphold, the one that we believe the Bible to teach. At some points in our history, there has been a variety of accepted views on justification, but they all existed under the framework of grace alone. Whatever a person's view is on justification, for it even to be considered as a valid viewpoint, it must be grace alone. What does the word grace mean? Unmerited favor. Justification is by grace and grace alone. Salvation is by grace and grace alone. Unmerited favor. So if anyone says you have to do X, Y, Z to be just in the sight of God, you reply, justification is by grace alone. Or to put it as Paul does in verse 33, it is God that justifieth. God justifies the elect. God justifies the elect. The Roman Catholic view of justification, they maintain a continuing justification by grace, faith, and works. Now, we'll speak about justification by grace, justification by faith, and justification by works in just a moment. They combine all of these into their understanding of a person's legal standing in the sight of God. But if our justification was by works... In, our, in God's courtroom in an eternal sense, in our legal standing before God, 
If our justification was by works, then our salvation would be partly by works. And Paul said in Romans chapter 11 that if by grace it is no more works, less grace is no more grace. How many times does the Word of God say that we're saved by grace? Ephesians 1, Ephesians 2, Titus 2, Titus 3, 2 Timothy 1, Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 11, Romans chapter 9. It is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Over and over and over and over, the Word of God declares emphatically that we are not saved by the things that we do. We are saved by grace. And if by grace it is no more of works, less grace is no more grace. And if it is by grace, then it is no more work, less work is no more work. Because grace and works, by definition, cannot mix. They are mutually exclusive concepts. They are opposites. Just as much as light and dark does not mix, oil and water does not mix, good and evil does not mix, grace and works do not mix. And so we are saved completely by God's unmerited favor. It is God that justifieth. It is God that justifieth. And so we know that that view is not right. Why? Because it contradicts Scripture, or rather, Scripture contradicts it. The traditional Protestant view of justification is that it occurs at the point of faith. Now, Scripture speaks about a justification by works, and Scripture speaks about a justification by faith. And we will clarify what both of those means in just a moment. It's very, very simple. The Protestant view is that we are justified at the moment that we come to faith. And there are differences in various denominational theological understandings on how a person comes to faith. There are some historically within Protestantism who believed about faith just like we do, that it is the result of the new birth, regeneration precedes or goes before faith. There are others who believe that faith sparks regeneration and justification in their theology comes at that moment. And by the way, this is important. You think this is turning into a, I went to a sermon and a theological lecture broke out. This is important. Many theological wars have been fought over the concept of justification. Many historic Baptists and others, Puritans, other Protestants from the 17th, 16th centuries believe that we are justified by the Lord Jesus on the cross of Calvary in a single act that applied to every single person for whom it was offered and justification happened at that moment in human history for the entire family of God once for all. And so then justification is not by works, nor does justification legally happen in God's courtroom when you're quickened or when you believe, but justification happened on the cross. And that is our view. And as we begin to study and unfold this, unpack this doctrine for you today, I believe it will be very evident that justification was a once for all act of God, God the Son offering Himself to God the Father, through the eternal spirit, God the Son, as Hebrews says, the work of the triune God on your behalf, justifying you in the sight of God. Now, as we introduce our concept, what we believe the Bible to teach about justification today, what do you do then with justification by works? Because the Bible teaches that there is a sense in which we're justified by works. Let it make you uncomfortable for just a moment before you hear the solution to it. The man who sparked the Reformation, Martin Luther, believed because of this verbiage in the book of James about being justified by works, he viewed the entire book of James as suspect and not to be considered canon. Sounds like a lot of Bible editors today, doesn't he? I don't believe that belongs in the Word, so we'll just cut it out and leave it on the editing table. As we say in the South, bless his heart. 
James is inspired scripture. It's the word of God. The words that we're about to read are inspired. What then do we do with them? James 2, verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? What? Wait a minute. You just said that we're justified exclusively by grace and not at all by works. Amen. How then are we justified by works? Again, was not Abraham our father justified by blank works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Now let me ask you the question. When Abraham, a man that had been walking by faith for, at this point, more than two decades. When he took Isaac upon the mount, when God said to offer your only begotten son unto me, and he raised the knife to slay Isaac and offer him as a burnt sacrifice, God stopped him, and Abraham, as we've discussed many times in the past, did so because he believed that God could resurrect him. He believed that God had promised him that seed, and when God told him to do that, he said, I will, I will perform this because God has commanded it, but I know that God will raise him again. He trusted in the power of the resurrection because he knew that God said, I will raise a nation out of him. So he didn't understand the command, but he went to obey the command. Did that act of Abraham render him more perfect, more worthy to stand before God in heaven? No. Not at all. How was Abraham justified by works? Now here's where we begin to explain what the Bible presents to us about justification. Many historic Baptists and others hold to a three-courtroom view of justification. A three-courtroom view of justification. In our legal system in the U.S., we have local courts. But then we also have appellate courts or appeals courts. And then above the appeals court, what do we have? We have a Supreme Court. Now this works on the state level, but it also works on the federal level. And since the federal government has authority over the states, the US Supreme Court is the highest court in the land but there are courts, appeals courts, and then there is the Supreme Court. Isn't that rather amazing that our legal system has a three courtroom view of justification? I wonder where they got that from. Scripture presents a, th a three courtroom view of justification. Now I'm going to explain what I mean by that in just a moment. You have to pay attention. This is a think message before it's a feel message. We started with feel, we went to think, we'll go back to feel in a minute. <laughs> Scripture presents a three courtroom view of justification. Courtroom number one. We are justified, declared righteous by our works that we do by faith in the sight of others. When James says Abraham was justified by works, by the way, works that were done how? By faith. Abraham declared himself righteous to the world. He proved, he vindicated his claim of faith, declaring himself a righteous man to any and everyone around him when he obeyed God. And he went to offer his son Isaac. There's another example of justification by works in James chapter 2. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and sent them out another way. 30 second summary of that. The children of Israel have left Egypt. They've wandered in the wilderness. They're going into Canaan's land. They come to Jericho. It's a walled city. They send in spies. Jericho knows that the spies are there. 
The spies stay overnight at Rahab's home. She receives them. Soldiers come to investigate. She lies and sends them another way and helps them escape the city. James 2 says she was justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. Did that earn her a place in glory? No. But it declared that she was a righteous person to the messengers. Her works wrought by faith, her works wrought by faith, declared that she was righteous in the sight of the messengers. Now, how do you know that this is the proper understanding of this? I saved this for last. Verse 18, Yea, a man will say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. I show my faith by my works and justify myself to the people that I show. Does that make sense? Perfect sense. That's what James is talking about here. We're not justified by works in God's courtroom. We are justified by works done by faith in the courtroom of public opinion. Chiefly, the opinions of those that we know and love who know and love Jesus. We declare to the messengers, as it were, that we are righteous. We declare to the messengers that we are righteous. Who do you think Abraham declared that he was righteous to when he offered up Isaac? He carried servants with him to the mount. He tells the servants, you wait right here. I and the lad will go up to worship and come again unto you. Abraham declares that he's righteous by the things that he does. Not to God and not to himself but to people in the world. And in that, he's justified by works. We are declared righteous. We are justified in our consciences by faith. This is the next court up. The lowest court in the land is justification by works, the court of popular opinion. Now, it's interesting if you notice the appellate nature of this. You are justified by works in the courtroom of public opinion. You are justified by faith in the courtroom of your conscience. Why would the courtroom of your conscience be a higher court than the court of public opinion? Listen to me. If everyone else in the world thinks that you are a low down, rotten, no good, worthless, sinful human being, but you know that you love Jesus, and you know that Jesus loves you, there is a peace that passeth all understanding in your conscience, even though the rest of the world thinks that you are a rotten, wicked heathen. What I feel about my relationship with Christ supersedes what other people believe about me. Have you ever met religious people who tell you that you're going to hell because you're not a part of their particular denomination? Those things bother me. There was a joke about one particular denomination, and this is not canon. But there's a joke about one particular denomination. There's the saints of glory up in heaven, and every denomination has their own room. And as a group of them are walking down the hallway with St. Peter, looking at all of these rooms with all of these windows and all of these people, there's one door and there's no window in it and there's no doorknob and the confused masses look at St. Peter why is there no window why is there no doorknob and he says shh they think they're the only ones here If other people think because you're just a historic Baptist that you're not orthodox enough in their opinion to go to heaven, but you know that you're right in your heart with Jesus, what you believe about your relationship with Jesus supersedes their opinion about you. Amen? Amen. It is a higher court in the land than that of public opinion. Justification by works 
refers to justification, the declaration of your righteousness in your conscience. Or, as we often refer to it, and this is a biblical term, the assurance of your salvation. Justification by faith is the assurance of your salvation. You are declared righteous in your conscience when you believe the promises of God as they apply to you. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul contrasts justification by works and justification by faith in Galatians and Romans chapter 3 and 4. No amount of good works will prove to your conscience that you are a righteous person. That leads to what? Phariseeism. I got to do enough good works to prove to myself that I'm righteous. No, 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 no. When you simply trust Christ and his promises as they apply to you, you experience a peace that passeth all understanding. You're not resting in the things that you've done. You're resting in the finished work of Christ and you know him and you know that if you know him, it's because he loved you and he chose you and he redeemed you. We know through 1 John that if we love him, it is because he what? He first loved us. And if he first loved us, then, beloved, read Romans chapter 8. Neither height nor depth nor things present nor things to come, nor any of the creatures shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you love him, it's because he first loved you. And when you love him and you believe and you believe in him and you believe him, the promises that he has given you, you experience a peace that passeth all understanding, the joy of your salvation. You can strengthen it. You can lose it. Not your salvation, but the joy of your salvation. David lost the joy of his salvation when he sinned with Bathsheba. Have you lost it in times past? Have you lost it even right now? then the answer is to throw yourself in faith at the feet of your Savior Jesus. To simply believe with a childlike faith, to be converted and become his little children. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace in our conscience, in our mind, in our heart, in our lives as we are declared righteous in this higher court than the court of public opinion, the courtroom of our conscience. By the way, Genesis chapter 15 is the proof text of justification by faith. It is the example. Paul uses it multiple times. Genesis 15, 6, And he, Abraham, believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. He believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. According to, now that's Genesis 15, 6. That's 15 years after Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees. According to the book of Hebrews chapter 11, Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees by faith 15 years prior to that. And yet in that moment in his life, he was justified by faith. That is the biblical proof text of justification by faith. What happened? He finally said, okay, God, you promised to give me a child. My wife and I are barren. We're beyond the age where you can have children. We left Ur of the Chaldees at 75. We're now in our late 90s. But we believe that you're going to give us a baby. You made the promise. We don't, under, we don't understand it, but we believe it. And when he believed the promise, he'd walked by faith 15 years. He was a born-again man for decades. But when he believed the promise, God counted it unto him for righteousness, unto his conscience. And there was a difference before and after that moment in his life. He finally said, God, I simply believe. That's a moment that needs to happen in all of our lives. And it might be something that needs to happen over and over in our lives. But we simply say, God, I believe. We are justified, declared righteous, in God's courtroom by the blood 
of Jesus, the offering of Christ upon the cross once for all. This is the Supreme Court. Now think about this for just a moment, and we're going to talk a little bit about this before we look at justification by blood. If you are innocent, and this has happened in human history, and the local district attorney or the detectives fake a case about you, this has happened. Overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, the people who bring charges against criminals love people and hate crime and do their best to protect the innocent and punish the guilty. But occasionally in human history, you do have times when someone has false charges brought against them. And we call that an injustice. And we hate injustice in this country. Our legal system is designed to... In a fallen world, create the least opportunity for injustice. If someone were to accuse you and you were innocent, but they found you guilty, what could you do? You could appeal. And you could appeal all the way up to the highest court of the land. How does that bring itself, that concept, into our theology today? I want to share with you a passage of Scripture from 1 John chapter 3. The world may condemn you, but you can appeal to what you know about yourself and your relationship with Christ and your conscience. You can appeal to a higher court. What if your heart condemns you? Now this answers the question, can you be a saved person and not experience assurance? And the answer to that question is yes. How do you know? 1 John 3. John is writing here about, if you know that he is righteous, chapter 2, verse 29, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. And this is something that John brings to our attention many times in 1 John. If you love, you're born of God. If you do righteousness, you're born of God. If you believe, you're born of God. All these evidences of grace. And he also speaks about the condition of the wicked and how they're just full of hate and they're murder and they do terrible things and we don't want to be like them. And how we're not like them in chapter 3 is that we love our brethren because by this shall all men know that you're my disciples when you love one another. And when you love one another, you have assurance. Hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. What's that talking about? Assurance of salvation. What is assurance of salvation in the justification theological framework? Justification by faith. The assurance of our salvation, being declared righteous in our conscience by faith, in our hearts by faith. If our heart condemn us, what happens, child of God, when you don't experience assurance? If our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart. There's a greater court, a higher court than the courtroom of your conscience. And it, it is the courtroom of God himself, where you're not declared righteous because of how hard you believe or how many good works you do. You are justified because Jesus laid down his life for you upon the cross of Calvary. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Romans 5, 9. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Much more than. There is a greater justification than justification by faith in your conscience. Justification by the blood of Jesus in God's sight, in God's courtroom. If the world condemns you, and your heart condemns you if Jesus died to take away your sins, even though your heart and the world condemns you, God is greater than your heart. And no man can lay anything to your charge because it is God that justifieth. Now, as we entitled our sermon today, The Last Adam, let's begin looking at 
the once for all nature of this justifying work of the Lord Jesus in our redemption. Once for all. I said everything that we said up to this point because over the past two weeks, Romans 5.18 has been echoing in my mind. So that was a 46-minute preface. There is a direct parallel between the work of Adam, the transgression of Adam, and the effect of that transgression on all in Adam and the work of Christ in salvation as it applies to all who are in Christ. Let me say that again. There is a direct parallel between the transgression of Adam and the effects of that transgression upon all in Adam and the work of Christ and the effects of the work of Christ upon all who are in Christ. And so when Paul speaks of this, he calls Christ the last Adam. A-D-A-M. The last Adam. The first Adam brought death. The last Adam brings the resurrection. In the book of 1 Corinthians 15, we referenced from this chapter last week. I'd encourage you to read the entire chapter. As it is written, the first man Adam was made a living soul. The last man Adam was made a quickening spirit. The last man, Adam. Again, a direct parallel. This means that if we study the nature of original sin and total depravity, Adam's transgression, we can actually learn some things about how Christ's sacrifice applies to all of us. Now, the word that I have, the phrase that I've used several times today as it relates to justification by blood, justification in God's courtroom, is once for all. Once for all. Regeneration is not once for all. Everyone in this room was regenerated, was quickened at a different time. In fact, regeneration is the only phase of our salvation that occurs individually like that because it's the vital phase. It applies to us, our own individual self when God comes to you and God quickens you. When he came to you when you were dead in trespasses and in sins and he drew you out of that, death and sin to life in Christ. Glorification happens all at the same time in the resurrection. Foreknowing and predestinating occurred at the same time in eternity past and we describe it in linear terms but... Truth be known, God has loved us with an everlasting love and with loving kindness has he drawn us. There's never a time that God didn't love you. We'll spend eternity attempting to fathom that. There's a phrase that we use and it's federal head. Federal head. We understand some things about federalism as United States citizens. We have representatives that are chosen from among the people to go and to represent our interest and the decisions that they make affect all of us. Adam is our federal head for all humanity. The federal head of all humanity. This means that Adam when he sinned, he represented you as your federal head in such a way that when he sinned, we were all guilty of his sin. You say, that's not fair. And first of all, if we want to talk about fair, Adam transgressed one law. He ate that which he was commanded not to eat. We were all in Adam, which is another point that we'll consider in just a moment. 
we would have done the same exact thing. Amen. All of us, infinitely, infinite times over, we would have all done the same thing because we are Adam multiplied. You say, I wouldn't have done it. You would have done it. You did do it because you're Adam and I'm Adam. We are Adam. He's our federal head. He represented us. At the same time as our father, we were yet in Adam when he sinned. In the book of Hebrews, just to briefly touch on this, you can read it on your own, Hebrews 7, 9 through 10. We read about a man, Melchizedek, and a man, Abraham. And Jesus' priesthood is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a king priest who had not received it by inheritance, nor did he pass it on to anyone else. Jesus is a king priest who did not receive it by inheritance but and did not pass it on to anyone else. Abraham was the father of the Levites, a priesthood that was inherited, that was passed on and on and on and on, a priesthood that could never take away sin by reason of the fact that they continued to offer these same sacrifices year after year, which could never take away sin. When Abraham meets Melchizedek, what does Abraham do? He pays tithes to Melchizedek. He gives him 10% of his spoil returning from fighting kings to rescue his brother Lot. Because Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, and Abraham was the father of the Levites, the Levites still being yet in his loins, the biblical language in Hebrews 7. Paul writes in Hebrews that the priesthood of Jesus being the type of priesthood as Melchizedek was superior to that of the Levites because the Levites are effectively paying tithes to Melchizedek. Now that's a complicated point, isn't it? But the point that he makes is that it was as good as if the Levites had done it because they were yet in his loins. We were yet in Adam's loins. We were there. We were there. We were all in Adam at the transgression. We were all in Christ at the cross. You say, I wasn't there, but you were. Not consciously, not physically. But in the mind and purpose of God, you were there in Christ at the cross. Your sin was imputed unto him. Look at verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. Of Romans 6, by the way. Our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. He that is dead is freed from sin. Dead how? We're still alive. Dead to sin through Christ because you were in Christ when he died for you. If we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. You were there. You were there. In a sense, you were there. He took the handwriting of ordinances that was against us and he nailed it to his cross. According to, I believe, the book of Colossians. Now let's read just a couple of passages and we'll close. A couple of passages and we'll close. Romans 5. Let's look at verse 6. When we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely shall a righteous man, or for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Verse 12, just to move forward quickly. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, what man? Adam. And death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Notice that verse ends in a colon. Notice verse 13 begins with a parenthesis. The parenthetical statement runs to verse 18. Tangents within tangents. Skip from verse 12 to verse 18. As by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, 
The free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. There's a direct parallel between the transgression of Adam and its effects upon the entire race and the work of Christ and the redemptive work of Christ and its effect upon an entire race. What race is that? All who were in Adam, all who were in Christ. Christ's work affects all that are in him. Adam's work affects all that were in him. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Chapter 6, verses 6 through 11. We just read most of that. Our old man is crucified with him. The body of sin would be destroyed, that we should henceforth not serve sin. If we be dead with Christ, we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. The first Adam was a living soul that transgressed and brought death to a race. The last Adam was a quickening spirit that not only saved us from our sins by his blood, but will resurrect us on the last day. The first Adam brought death. The last Adam brought life. As Adam represented all of us, we did nothing to accept nor reject Adam's transgression, did we? No, it was out of our hands. Likewise, with the work of Jesus, it is the work of God by grace and free grace alone. We'll close with Romans 5 and verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, the work of Adam, grace did much more abound. The work of the last Adam is so infinitely, eternally greater than the work of the first Adam that where the sin that we inherited from the first Adam abounded, grace did much more abound. Amen. Amen. The last Adam has brought life. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for sending your son into the world to die for us. We sang to him and about him today, man of sorrows, what a name for the son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. And we say all together, Father, hallelujah, what a savior. We pray in his name and we say amen.